I've been a band 4 in 2018, a band 5 in 2019, band 6 in 2020, band 7 in 2021, and in 2022, I became a band 8. You will come to a point when you realize that when you constantly seek for remuneration, you constantly feel tired and feel um, like you still don't have enough. But when you just do what you love doing, the people around you will see that you deserve so much more. My name is Mark Doblas. I was supposed to be named Michael, but then my father decided to change my name to Mark because he wanted me to make a mark to every person that I meet and he also wanted me to make a mark wherever I go. Since my mother is a nurse herself, but she wasn't able to fulfill her dreams of working as a nurse abroad, she somehow instilled in me at an early age take, looking after people. So when I graduated nursing, I became a nurse. I worked in a surgical ward of a 200-bedded hospital and then moved on to work in a, an orthopedic ward in a 1,200-bedded hospital. Also, I did volunteer work as a nurse. I also studied education. I also took teacher's licensure examination for me to solidify that knowledge in teaching and also that experience. It was so hard to work as a nurse in the Philippines because the hospitals are always overcrowded with patients and the nurses are paid really less, so I was eager to get out of the country. There's just a lot of twist of fate that happened in my life, but that instead of working as a nurse somewhere else. I flew to Singapore and then I landed in a banking job but then it didn't work out for me. I didn't stay long in Singapore. I had to go back home because I felt like I miss home so much. Later on I had an opportunity to go abroad again so I went to um, Dubai. So the catch there was I need to start a training center so I became the um, training manager of the training center in Dubai, teaching nurses, helping nurses to work in the UK. So it was centered towards recruiting nurses in the Middle East and helping them with their training so that they can move to the United Kingdom. When um, I realized that I'm already very close to the United Kingdom, so why don't I try it myself? I then um, went with my students in one of the hotels where the interview was conducted. So I was coaching them, I was prepping them. When I was bored waiting for them, I said, well, I'm also a nurse, why don't I just try it? Just so I can make the experience a full circle so I would know what they're going through. And then when I sat there, um, the interviewer said, you already have everything ready for you. You're good to go to the UK. Now I'm led to the country where I always have dreamt of coming and working at. I'm led to the same profession that I wanted to do. Moving to the UK, I thought it, was, it would be easy. It was a whole lot of adjustment. I didn't really expect and I thought I would, I would be okay with it, but I wasn't. So in the first six months, it was a struggle. I came to a point where I had to seek um, therapy because I wasn't coping really well. So I, I failed in the first OSCE exam. I was so depressed because I'm a nurse, I'm a trainer, I help nurses to come to the UK, um, I trained them, but then I failed in that particular training that I thought I'd be more familiar compared to the others. It didn't make sense to me at all why I failed the examination, why I had to struggle to come to the UK when in fact I had a very good career in Dubai. It's a whole lot of things I have to adjust to, the food, the weather, the culture, the language, the people, but I never gave up. There were a lot of challenges, a lot of frustrations, self-doubt, imposter syndrome that creeps in. I know my job very well. I'm not a new nurse. I'm just new to this country. 
but sometimes my colleagues would expect that I know everything already when in fact there are so many differences in practice that I can somehow easily adjust to had I been supported. Nine months in the UK, I applied for um, a facilitator job. I didn't get shortlisted for my first attempt. I know I'm qualified for the job. The recruitment process is just so different. And I said, that doesn't stop me. Going on my first year in the UK, I applied to become a facilitator. I got shortlisted. I was so happy just by being shortlisted. I know that after the interview, you will have to wait for them to deliberate. But then right there and then, they offered me the job. After a year of doing the job, she then um, said that we need someone to run the team. I applied for the role. I got the job. I was up against my own trainer, my mentor when I arrived in the UK. I'm just happy that they saw a potential in me to delegate that, that big responsibility of leading the team. I'm glad that the RUH really valued my experience in training, nursing, and recruitment because that's what I'm exactly doing now here in the Trust. And now in 2023, I'm not a Bandai, but I will be working for um, a project um, with NHS England. I am now a Southwest Regional Fellow for International Retention and a part of the CNO CMIDO BME SAG Advisory Group Fellow as well. We have been fortunate to have a few successes. Last year, in the RUH Annual Awards, I won the Personal Achievement Award and the Special Recognition Award. And our trust has also been nominated or shortlisted in the Nursing Times Workforce Award for the Best Employer for Diversity and Inclusion through the efforts of my team. This year, I'm proud to say that we again are nominated in the Nursing Times Workforce Award in a different category as Best Employer for international, Best International Recruitment Experience. I myself have been nominated in two different categories, Overseas Nurse of the Year and also Diversity and Inclusion Champion of the Year. Apart from that, I'm also very lucky to have received the first ever Kindness and Civility Award in the RUH. As a gay Asian expat on a working visa, here are a few words I'd like for you to ponder on. Where we feel like we belong, we have a seat at the table, we have a voice, and our voices are heard. But personally, in this community, I was able to have that voice empowered. So our energy and enthusiasm during our recruitment stage must be equal to our desire for our internationally educated colleagues to stay and thrive. This balance, is this a balancing act between the need to be a competent professional at the same time navigating through new linguistics? Do we see them as incompetent because they have a hard time understanding our medical abbreviations? Or do we view, view them as smart because they understand four or more languages. We must appreciate different approaches to nursing used across the globe. Our nursing is not the only nursing. And recognize the difference when helping them adjust to UK nursing. Those nurses come with wealth of knowledge and experience. We should utilize it. Understanding that UK nurses can learn new skills from IENs as well, in the same way that IENs can learn from UK nurses personal social cultural reality. Understanding and celebrating that everyone has a unique cultural imprint. Foster that authenticity. Celebrate diversity. Prioritize inclusion. Let people flourish and be who they are. Quality, diversity, and inclusion. As Ed mentioned a while ago, the rest data will tell us that our BME colleagues are less likely to be shortlisted for a job more likely to enter formal disciplinary processes, less likely to access man-mandatory training, more likely to experience bullying, and less likely to be in senior roles. We should lean into allyship and advocacy. Conscious inclusion, 
recognize racism, tackle discrimination, challenge aggressions. We all must take that responsibility in getting it right and strive to continuously improve. We must keep in mind that IEMs are not newly qualified nurses. For all you know, they've been trained for 10, 15 years. We should provide bespoke training that takes into account their previous experience. We could also provide adjustments as well in the provision, so many other things that we can, we can give them. Say for example, uh, prolonged time off to visit family in their home countries. Personally, I live in a far-flung area in the Philippines. It takes me 28 hours to see my family, not to mention the cost of getting there. And I'm only allowed two weeks of an leave. But I hope that the magnitude and life-changing impact of leaving home, coming to the UK and working for the NHS is clear. And that we continue our commitment to support our internationally educated colleagues to stay and thrive. Thank you. And even though I'm far from my family, I just get to talk to them every weekend. The bond is still really strong. And in the weekdays when I'm working, I have my own family in the UK through my friends. So they're, they're the people I consider my family in the UK because I've known them 10, 15 years already from way back home. So when I got to establish my myself in the UK, I then asked my friends to come over. It's just nice to have that support system. It's nice to have that familiar face that you've been longing to see. Like my story, I failed a lot of times. I had to struggle a lot of times. It doesn't mean I'm not struggling now. I still am, but it's a different kind of struggle. As long as you've built that better and that core within you to be able to hurdle through all these struggles, you'll be good, you'll be fine, you'll survive. So again, this is Mark Doblas. This is my journey. Padayon.